This is Inside Executive. I'm Kim Bailey and she's Fuliana Osborne. Today we're going to ask the question, what do you like to ask business, other business leaders when given the opportunity? So we're talking here about what would you, in a situation where you met a business leader, whether it's in your own industry, another industry, an icon of industry, whatever the situation is, if you were given the opportunity to ask this person some questions, what would they be? And we're not talking about uh, the situation where you ask a question so that they can hear how clever you are when you answer it yourself. We're not talking about you asking them for a job. We, we really want to explore what would you do given the opportunity to ask someone with that kind of background and knowledge and information, what would you ask them that would be a where their answer would be a benefit to you, would be a, ed, an education value to you. One of the questions I would ask, there might have been um, along their journey, they're successful business people at the moment, but along their journey, they might have had a time where there was a risk to the business. And if they did, what caused the risk and how did they handle it? What I'm looking for in that answer is to learn that even in the most successful uh, examples, there would have been tough times. How did they personally handle it so I can learn? Is it just resilience? Is it just about finding out what was wrong and what caused that risk? Maybe they're very, very good. Say they have a technical company they just put together, and but they want strong business leaders in the sense of running the business, the finance side the paperwork, all of those things. I would like to understand, and uh, if they happy to, share their journey with me in that regard so I learn from it. Well, I think it's, it's interesting to look at this as a question of what are we expecting to learn? What do we need to learn from this situation? And we think about if we were in their position and someone was asking us this question, what would we be confident about sharing what is the information that we would like to pass on to others that are that do have an open mind that do want to learn and one of my great strengths I think over the years is that I love to learn from every industry I haven't ever limited myself to knowing what's happening within the industry that, that I'm working at the time and I have brought innovation and process from all sorts of industries into other industries where they would not ever have thought of approaching a, a particular issue or process in that way because they weren't exposed to the way it was done somewhere else in some other industry that they didn't think was anywhere near related to what they were doing. So I guess my first question would be along those lines. It would be about the most surprising thing that they had learnt from another industry because I think that's quite an insight into how broadly they think themselves. And, and from that then I would get a sense of how much more I could learn from any other questions I asked. I would ask them about their management style and how that changed, if it has changed. Like when they started off with the business, how was it? Did they change in a sense of very hands-on to start off with and then becoming less and less so or micromanagers or open door style? All these things that we hear about, I, I like to hear how they find it and how they changed, if they changed. And was that for the better, for the worse? And what was the drivers? Again, the main reason for asking is to see how each one of us apply themselves to different situations. Now, I think the, the, the reason of why they, if they've changed style, why they've changed style is probably a fascinating one because you, you tend, we tend, we do tend to look at the tall poppies, to look at the people who are successful in any industry and think, well, they, they got there because they must be really good at everything that they do and that's not necessarily the case. And... It can be quite an insight, again, for you and for us to hear what things still trouble these, these people who are business leaders. What things do they still struggle with? What areas would they still like to improve? Because I, I would believe, and that certainly from experience, know that the business leaders that I've dealt with don't think they're perfect, don't think that there's nothing left to learn, don't think that they have all the skills that they need. And that's can be an eye-opener to see what they think they still need to improve on. Another area that I always love hearing about is 
how did the competition shape their business? Other the competitors in their own field, how did they react to that? Did they just try to sort of catch up, play catch up? Did they try to beat them? Did they try to what whatever it is is how they treated the impact of competition on their business? As an interesting aside, and I think we'll we'll talk about it in a different podcast. There's a whole school of thought at the moment that there are no winners in business at present because we set ourselves up across our lives for competition where there can only be one winner. And so and everything that is done to pursue the one winner theory means that everyone else must be bad or doesn't do it as well or fails in some way. And that's a, an area that I'm keen to explore because it's just being started to be talked about in terms of business. We've talked about it or it has been talked about in terms of schooling of education for some time. But in terms of business, I'd like to hear what a business leader thought about the competitive framework and whether that is the best model for business going forward into the future, whether we do need to have a, a complete paradigm shift about how we see business and the business community, not just individual business areas, but the economy as a whole, whether we're not setting ourselves up for a fall if we start to embrace technology and then find that we haven't got industries left for the technology that we've embraced. <laughs> if I had the opportunity to be with a business leader who started their business from scratch, then sold it, then started another and another, I would like to ask them how did they decide when to sell? Did they have an exit strategy in place? Was it at the beginning of the setup? Was it in the middle? Or was it towards the end? Or were they for? <laughs> <laughs> oh, or what did they, what elements go into deciding that? And how does it feel to build something up and then give it away? Give it away, of course, at a very big price. That's not what I meant. I meant is that you see, you know, you're just giving away a baby that you nurtured from the beginning and saw it blossom and, and being very successful. Or is it a stage of life thing? Is that now that your company is at a stage, but you're also at a stage of wanting to retire and play a different role, I want to hear what would that role be? Will it be in the capacity of a chair at, on a board? Or would it be like you'd rather be way away from that business because you've already have had a number of examples where you wanted to say to yourself, I wanted to do it differently, but you already handed it over to someone else. So in that same light, we, as human resources practitioners, have a belief that people change their careers and their career, or their career path, their career, not so much the industry, but just their careers, usually on average about three times in their lifetime. So if I look at myself, you know, I started out, I trained at the university level in one field. I worked in an associated field for a while and then I changed absolutely and completely to a different field. And that by that stage I was early 40s and then if I look more recently I have again changed to a completely different field when I was in my 50s. And now, getting closer to the next zero birthday, I am in a different field again. So, and I've gone from from being in an, an industry that was outdoors, you know, construction industry, to consulting that was always indoors uh, and not in a, a construction, or well, not restricted to the construction field and not about construction, that consulting work was done. And I went from there into online businesses and the online businesses range from repairing old books to floral art, which is obviously the passion now, but in between time, I ran a lolly shop. So, you know, completely different activities and completely different careers, I guess, at those stages. So it would be interesting to talk to business leaders, I think, and ask them that question. Ask them if they have had those changes, if they've had those dramatic um, about faces, you know, right angle turns, and have they had three complete changes of career in their lives? And it's probably an interesting question for you to ask yourself at whatever stage you are at. What if we came across someone who has worked within Australia only and have built businesses in remote Australia. That would really fascinate me. I would want to ask them, 
what was the experience in building a business and such a successful one in a remote country as big as ours? I would like to know that because that would be new to me. I haven't come across someone like that and would, I imagine, learn very, very valuable lessons about how what looks impossible, somebody makes it possible. Business leaders are obviously going to, to be walking around with a, a wealth of experience that they might not want to share with whoever's asking the question. But they also, I think, have life experiences that are just as interesting as their, their business experiences, and those are probably even more difficult to get access to. But I guess if we can, if we assume that we're going to be able to get access to life experiences as well as business experiences, and just because they're a business leader doesn't negate the fact that they're still a person. So my question would be that within their life as a whole, if they looked at both business and non-business activities, what was the area or is the area that provides them with the most sense of satisfaction? Not necessarily pleasure, but the sense of satisfaction of a job well done or of a, of a, a goal achieved. So it's satisfaction. Another thing would be to understand what sacrifices, if any, you know, the pleasure of being a very successful business leader, but what sacrifices had to happen along the way and how great was the reward at the end of it? It's got and how, to be... and how did they identify those sacrifices? How did they make the decision that these were the sacrifices that, that had to be made? And again, it's subjective a bit because for someone, what might be a sacrifice to another might be not a big issue. It's not really a sacrifice. But it's good to hear the individual experience and how they interpret their journeys. And just on that, I will say that we haven't had a television at home in this century. I can say that. <laughs> the only person I know. <laughs> and, and this is exactly it. People generally will say to my partner and I, oh, did you see such and such? And they know we haven't got a TV. They know we haven't had a TV for all those years. And still the first question out of their mouths is, oh, did you see such and such last night? Or did you hear about this? Now, we made a conscious decision not to have television, uh, not to have cable, not to have any of those those distractions because they were distractions and we knew we'd continue to be. And we weren't getting any value from them. Yeah, certainly we both enjoyed watching some particular sport activities, but we can still do that and we can do that live and it becomes an event rather than a sit in the chair and veg out activity. It meant that we had more time for reading, for pursuing our particular interests. And I know my partner is far more diligent in finding things that he can listen to or he can read. I'll just follow the path that I'm happy following and I, I do the reading. He learns better from hearing things or from seeing videos. I'll learn much better if I get to read it and assimilate it that way. So it gave us the you know, decision not to have TV, that sacrifice that it is seen as a sacrifice in 90% of the population that we deal with, but we didn't see as a sacrifice. And still we will say to people, we get two kinds of reactions. We'll say, oh, we don't have TV. We haven't had TV since 1999. And the reaction is either good on you, that's such a good thing to do. There's nothing on TV anyway, but they can't, these people can't drag themselves away from that, that process that they have of, of winding down by watching the TV or getting their information that way. Or the other reaction is, why not? I couldn't live without it. How do you know what's happening in the world? And my response to that is I am horrified to think that people feel that they need a television to find out what's happening in the world. Quite honestly, if you've got a television, you don't know what's happening in the world. That there is far more advances in business, in science, in technology that you can find out about through all of the resources that are available to us now that are not television. So it wasn't a sacrifice for us. Bottom line, it wasn't a sacrifice for us, but many people see it as a sacrifice. <laughs> I want to know, when you become a very successful business person and you're right on top of your tree, so to speak, do you ever have self-doubt? Do you ever think, all right, I've achieved this? Let's say they towards their second half of their career, in other words, 60 plus and the, to anyone that might look like okay well, it's time to retire whatever it is but to that person it may not do they have self-doubt do they think i made it that's good i don't know how i got here but i'm happy i got here <laughs> or do they say oh look I, I really don't know am i going to continue to grow or have i run out of ideas again to each person that would be a completely different approach 
And again, I like to hear those differences. I think it's good to have self-doubt. I think it's good to question whether you are pushing yourself, whether you're doing the best. You know, to me, it, it means that you're questioning whether you're doing the best that you possibly could be doing. And it's not about what other people think. And that's a very important lesson that everyone should learn. Is that what other people think of you is their business, not yours. Hard to accept until you really think about it and really work out about how you're measuring yourself. And so that would be a question that I'd like to know, is do these business leaders worry about what other business leaders think of them? Because I'd be interested to know whether they are concerned about their judgment by their peers, I guess, is what it is. I asked a successful business leader, and this was a small family-owned business, what do they do to relax? And the person looked at me, and their partner was standing right there, and the person looked at me and said, I go to work. And I said, oh, no, I don't think you heard my question. <laughs> and uh, his partner said, oh, yes, he did. <laughs> and not only that, but he's right. He is more relaxed when he is working. To him, it's not a job. It's to not him, working. It's not working. It's not working. Yeah. Uh, give him things like fix up the yard or do anything yeah, to do with, with the home. It's it's not really comfortable. No. Uh, what what he enjoys the most is to be working. So and again because he doesn't think of it as working. It's it's not yes. it's not working in the business, it's working on the business and it gives him the opportunity to extend himself to practice all of the skills that he's developed up to this point. And, and you can understand that, that you know, if someone who is so passionate, and you know, we've talked about passion before and about and how infective that can be, infectious that can be, I said the wrong word again, <laughs> how infectious that can be, why would you feel comfortable about going to mow the lawn if that is a, a task or an activity that you can't see the value of long term, that's not contributing towards you doing everything else better in the big picture. So that's, to me, that would be the right answer. Yes, go to work if that's what makes you happy. Another question for a business person who's got a privately owned business, as not listed, is who do you answer to? Who do you answer mm -hmm. to? Mm -hmm. You don't have shareholders. Who are you accountable to? Yeah, yeah. who are you accountable to? How do you keep yourself on track with the decisions that, or with the, sorry, with the goals that you set, how do you differentiate between the things that you need to be answerable to on your business front, on your personal front, and on your, I guess, fun, uh, how would you say, whether you played sport, activities, or whatever, how do you balance all of that? Because you're not accountable to anyone, really, yet you're successful, you got it right, how do you do that? What and, tools do yeah, you use? And, and in being successful and, and yes. being a leader, then you must have got it right. So yes. how did you do it? Because for the bulk of us, we need to be accountable in some way to someone or for something. So it, that would be a fascinating question to ask. I like that one. We can keep that one on the list. Good work. Thank you. <laughs> so today we've looked at the question of what would you like to ask a business leader, given the opportunity to do so. I hope that that stimulated some thought processes for you and we'd be interested to see what you in fact would ask business leaders if you were given the opportunity. And we'll throw those questions open to comment on the website as well so that in the event that down the track we have business leaders here, we can throw some of those questions at them and say that they've been provided by people who are interested in your answers. So let us know what your question would be if you were given the opportunity to ask a business leader something and we'll work on that and produce it for a future podcast. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Kim Bailey. She's Fuliana Osborne and this is Inside Executive.